everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the great people at Ross and I for organizing this event and giving all the speakers an opportunity to share with the community. Uh, I'm Michael, CEO of Cognicept, headquartered in Singapore since 2018. Uh, oh, sorry, next slide. Yeah, Cognicept is part of the Air Conditions and Task Resolution Working Group hosted by Ross I APAC at ARTC. Uh, today we're going to go through some of the learnings and insights we've gained over the course of our work. Next slide. Uh, we've all heard a lot of hype in the press about how robots and AI are going to produce a um, golden future where machines will do everything and no one has to work. We're a post-scarcity society where we can spend our time at the beach or playing video games, but there is a problem. Uh, far from being a steady march to greatness, past and present of robotics and AI is rife with examples of the, the now practicalities preventing our machines from delivering on the promise and purpose of robotics. Uh, if you want to know what the future really holds, it's not the YouTube highlight reels that uh, you, that really matter, it's the outtakes that should have our attention. Um, here we have a quote from Scott Hassan. Uh, he's the founder of Villa Garage, a pioneering robotics lab that I think most of us are familiar with. He was also instru instrumental in the creation of Google. Uh, and he says computers are fabulous, but they're nothing compared to the human brain. It would take hundreds of PhDs uh, in computer science, mechanical, and electrical engineering to build a system that does something as simple as nudge a wastebasket under a chair. Um, there, are, there are billions of people on the planet, so why not use them as the intelligence? Next slide. Next, we have Richard Socher, uh, who is the chief scientist at Salesforce. He implements artificial intelligence solutions there. And he said AI is a complex field, and he's the first to say that computer scientists haven't progressed as far as many people believe. Uh, for instance, there are no credible research past any kind of conscious AI algorithm, and there are no robots that are truly autonomous and able to make their own decisions. Uh, so don't worry about walking terminators. Next slide. Uh, bringing this into concrete terms, I think we've all seen this problem at one time or another. A robot is not sure where it is, where it's going, or what it's looking at. Maybe it's a mapping error, maybe the environment has changed, maybe objects in the surroundings are too dynamic, maybe it's reflection, bad lighting, glare, faulty master data, who knows. Uh, next slide. Sure, if we can control the environment and work scope, the technology does work. Uh, but exercising this control is very difficult, and it's a challenging task to account for all of the various pitfalls that are introduced by the chaos of the real world. So the need for human involvement complicates this widely held view that AI will automate everything. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, exercising control results in a sacrifice of adaptability. Uh, but adaptability is one of the most valuable attributes of smart robots. It sort of sets them apart from more traditional automation, which is extremely efficient at the expense of adaptability. For example, the Swiss Army knife is a combination of many tools that would work much better if they were not combined. Uh, a pencil sharpener is very good at sharpening pencils, but not very effective as a can opener or fingernail trimmer. In short, adaptability comes with a cost. Uh, but it allows us to accommodate for this variability, and the variability is often avoidable if we can shape our process to eliminate it. Uh, these seem like trivial examples, but it gets deeper, and it does apply to robotics. Uh, traditional automation and mechanization are not flexible, but, very, but very efficient. Uh, they generally handle a very small number of possibilities, but serve uh, that specific purpose very efficiently, whereas robotics is more flexible and can be easily reconfigured for various purposes. Next slide. The most common role of a human employee inside an automation loop is exception handling. Rather than encode automated solutions for every possible class of exception within a process, it's much simpler uh, and more efficient to simply halt the exception cases within the process and require the automation loop to ask for human feedback. The chart above very concisely explains how we decide the balance between human and machine inputs. Our 2D chart is oversimplified, but it illustrates a concept. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we essentially have probability of human error, and on the vertical axis, the severity of impacts for edge cases. For example, many manufacturing processes are fully automated because the probability of human error is much higher than machines, and the severity of errors is fairly low. Uh, Self-driving vehicle technology, on the other hand, is roughly on par or maybe slightly superior to the performance of a human driver, uh, but the severity of failures is extreme. So for this reason, any self-driving system currently available requires a human driver to be ready to take over at a moment's notice. Um, realistically, the decision tree gives us a better idea of how we should make decisions about the balance between machine and human inputs. Uh, in many cases, as autonomy increases in capability, uh, making fewer errors, humans will be shifted out of the loop, moving sort of down into the left of, of the probability matrix. Um, next. Oh, yeah, this is it, considerations. Uh, going beyond the decision tree, we need to carefully consider some of these important points. Um, are the error conditions known or unknown? Are there ways to identify a novel failure and classify it? Um, is the human input method safe? 
Uh, challenges like latency and connectivity to the output device can negatively affect safety, and this needs to be assessed for any system of remote operation. What is the required response time? If there's a 15 second gap between the moment a robot reports an error and the point an operator can intervene, then this will limit the types of systems where online moderation is practical, no speeding vehicles on public roads. How long does it take for the robot to be brought back to normal operation? Uh, are these systems being used, able to quickly convey the situation? Do these systems provide enough assistance and guidance for a human operator to resolve an error in a practical time frame? Um, is there an effective process of escalation? Depending on the proximity of the robot, uh, sorry, of the human operator, there may be uh, cases where a person needs to perform some actions to repair the robot or manipulate the workspace. All of these elements are important to include in a system of moderation and error resolution. Uh, bringing us to a concrete example, uh, we have some data here that outlines the ways in which mobile robots commonly fail. This data was collected by Cognizant's support team over the course of about a year from robots performing a variety of tasks like surveillance in public spaces, indoor delivery, and logistics tasks. Uh, these are terminologies we use internally. Uh, what we call navigation failure is actually more often an environment failure or customer error, but the outcome is the same. The robot has been interrupted. Uh, with few exceptions, these errors are rooted in variability in the work environment scope, uh, which is often practical to control. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the history uh, and future of error resolution. Uh, autonomy doesn't just work and has always required human inputs. Uh, it has always been a human labor multiplier, and currently robotics is no exception. Uh, consider the factory worker. Having the worker on site ensures rapid response and sort of good interface, since they're in the familiar physical world. Uh, next up, we have autopilot. Uh, we've heard a lot uh, that, uh, aside from taxiing, takeoff, and landing, that planes fly themselves. And while the traveling public tends to imagine uh, the autopilot does all the work, the reality is the autopilot system doesn't fly the plane, the pilot flies through the automation, as one pilot put it. Uh, the cockpit can be a very busy place. Pilots are consistently having to command, manipulate, and manage various parts of the computer system, which requires a lot of attention. Additionally, about 99% of landings are manual, and 100% of all takeoffs must be done manually by the pilot. Uh, here's an example close to my heart. I built both demining robots and subsea ROVs early in my career. Uh, in these telerobotic devices, the bulk of the intelligence is provided by a human pilot. Uh, this is usually done using sophisticated systems that give the pilot multiple views of the workspace, uh, haptic or feedback controls, dead man switch safety mechanisms, and in some cases, VR headsets to provide 3D representations of the robot's workspace. There are, however, many sub-functions which are largely automated. In ROVs, things like station keeping, valve manipulation, and hot stab connections are heavily assisted by machine intelligence. Um, in the case of demining and ordnance disposal robots, things like mine sweeping are automated, while direct manipulation of explosive charges is done manually by a robot pilot. Uh, next, there's an example that has received a great deal of press coverage, the self-driving vehicle safety driver. Here, the bulk of the work is done by the machine intelligence. Uh, since the cost of errors can be high, even including human life, a safety driver is required to constantly monitor the vehicle, be ready to take control at a moment's notice. Being in the vehicle eliminates many concerns related to connectivity, latency, and bandwidth restrictions. The most common form of smart robotics deployments in the present day requires some on-site management. Uh, in this scenario, the robots run autonomously with very little requirement for human intervention. These scenarios are usually designed around the capabilities of the robot, eliminating that variability and restricting human interaction in very specific ways. Uh, then these are deployed monolithically with all the infrastructure and process changes included as part of the deployment. Uh, even with this level of variability control, there is still generally some need to have on-site staff that are familiar with the technology to ensure its continuous operation. Um, to avoid long walks through a facility, um, or in some cases to allow location flexibility, remote management tools have more recently been incorporated into these systems. Uh, remote management tools allow support staff to see their fleet at an aggregate level intervene remotely to resolve a large percentage of the edge cases. Uh, these range from simple to elaborate. Some systems simply report device statuses and limited sensor information, while others grant access to detailed information from cameras, sensors, and navigation computers. Uh, remote management systems will typically include features such as monitoring, observability, retrospective analysis, and intervention. Uh, when the autonomy fails and performance cannot be recovered by a human supervisor, either because they aren't sufficiently trained or because they're not within the robot's proximity, a remote system such as this can be used. The causes of automation failure are different than causes of human failures, like fatigue and workload, so they're more difficult for human operators to understand or predict. 
Short-term loss of situation understanding is a prominent issue in these frameworks. Recovery from failure may be delayed because more time is required for a human to gain situational awareness and understanding of the cause of a failure. Uh, transparency between human and autonomous agents is a major issue for remote management systems. Uh, in many cases, failure conditions can be well understood and classified, what we term white box errors. These are essentially known unknowns. Accurately identifying the error can go a long way towards providing an operator the level of understanding required to resolve an issue. On the other hand, we have black box errors. These are unknown unknowns. Still, a robust, a robust system of automatic error classification and reporting uh, can provide much needed insights that assist an operator in narrowing the scope of possible error causes and result in more rapid resolution. These automatic classification systems can also enable rapid deployment since they reduce the need for perfection. Augmented supervised autonomy is largely about rapid resolution. To facilitate this, it's valuable to have a common intuitive interface that can be used across all robotic systems in a facility or deployment. It's important to have a good system to track intervention demand using error tickets that can communicate the relative urgency and status of each error condition. Uh, of course, augmented autonomy should assist an operator in gaining situational awareness and providing plausible resolution strategies. These suggestion engines essentially transform an essay question into a multiple choice question. Uh, rather than expecting an operator to thoroughly examine and interpret the workspace, a suggestion engine can provide resolution options generated by machine intelligence, providing potential answers to, uh, instead of raw information, uh, it reduces cognitive load and improves resolution. Uh, the Cognicept error remediation stack brings clarity to robot errors. The approach here is to have a robot-facing agent that simply reports errors and logs. A downstream UI can then process this data and make remote diagnostics possible. The intelligent layer in the middle receives information from the agent and then provides more context about the error by classifying it and providing a predefined resolution if a resolution is documented. The Cognicept agents are responsible for listening to the logs uh, for successful and unsuccessful events, and the ECS helps provide a qualified judgment in case the robot fails. The ECS also acts to simplify errors so that a broader workforce can engage with the robots. This moderated ECS is iterative and extremely scalable can even act as a gateway for future reinforcement learning for different applications. Uh, this is a great complement to the Cognicept Smart Plus robotic intervention system. Uh, let's have a look at a few examples of how these tools have been and can be used. Uh, in a retail scenario, a grocery chain purchased robots to help control the aisles for hazards and spills, etc., uh, so that employees could spend more time helping customers. But due to frequent interruption and autonomy shortcomings, Customers complained that the robots consistently got in the way of their shopping and sort of called them a nuisance. Um, frequent false positive alerts caused employees to dedicate more time to attending to uh, apparent spills rather than assisting, assisting customers. So online moderation would have made this million dollar investment worthwhile by reducing these false positives and improving the customer experience. Um, here is a pilot that was run at a small scale uh, dynamic warehouse application. Performing at 100%, it was uh, estimated that 20 robots in a small e-commerce warehouse deployment would have resulted in a net manpower savings of $110,000 a month. But with an observed 25% error rate, the solution would have cost actually $180,000 with a downtime, so a net, a net loss of 70 k uh, The solution was then rejected. Uh, even at a 5% error rate, more than half the predicted savings would have been eroded. Um, but in the end, error handling software and services produced an ROI of $175,000 a month cost of 2K a month. Uh, so you can see that most of those errors were uh, eliminated by the introduction of this software. Uh, so many applications require human in the loop uh, because it's often not practical to have robotic savvy staff near the robot. Sure, you may be able to justify having that kind of worker at a large logistics center, but a mall security guard can hardly be expected to maintain and troubleshoot robots. Similarly, there are many applications where it's impractical to have human staff at all, like outdoor areas and public spaces. Error resolution is an inherent part of all automation. Robotics developers strive for complete autonomy, but this pursuit of perfection shouldn't stop us from taking advantage of the technology today. In closing, I would like to bring attention back to some of the work Cognicept has done with Ross I. Uh, the Cognicept agent, linked above, identify and report errors from the robot side. Um, oh, sorry, are we on the right slide? Uh, one more, there we go. Uh, the Cognicept agents linked here uh, identify and report errors from the robot side. Those reports are then received by the ECS, which filters and classifies the errors. This project was carried out together with great support and direction from Ross Industrial APAC. Our agents and the basic ECS is available as open source packages. You can download the agents and the ECS server to work with your robots. 
Uh, these agents have been tested with both ROS1 and 2, and that includes the latest ROS2 Foxy release. So join us in our mission to combine the best attributes of robots and humans for a better future. Let's uh, open it up to some questions now. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we are now move on to a short Q&A session. Participants, do submit your questions on Slido by scanning the QR code at the right side of your screen. All right, we have one question on screen for Michael. So first question is, for industrial robots like robotic arm gripper or pick and place, may I know the percentage of developer using ross I versus manufacturer's proprietary software? Uh, I would really have to guess on this because I, I don't have those numbers, but um, based on the people that I know personally, uh, a lot of them are using raw side tools, um, but uh, I think that in uh, other spaces, you know, like uh, uh, the proprietary systems are often used, so they really don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Are there any more questions from the participants? Okay, um, I guess there's no more other questions uh, from participants. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.